Do you remember when this spacecraft, OSIRIS-REx, rendezvoused with this asteroid, Bennu? This is the very moment OSIRIS-REx bounced off the asteroid's surface and at the same time secured valuable surface material to return to Earth. The sample then parachuted down in September 2023, but two stock fasteners that kept the return capsule locked meant that the scientists couldn't get to the sample until four months later. But now the wait is finally over and they have published their findings. Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu and in this week's video, let's talk about what's on Bennu. Yeah. The OSIRIS-REx mission collected a sample of rocks and dust from the asteroid Bennu. And this is just the third sample return mission ever from an asteroid. The first and second were both from Japanese space agency JAXA's Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 missions. Hayabusa visited the near-Earth asteroid Itakawa, which is an S-type asteroid, which is stony type. Hayabusa 2 visited Ryugu, a primitive C-type or carbonaceous type asteroid, whilst OSIRIS-REx visited the B-type asteroid Bennu, which is also carbonaceous. But this mission stands out not just on the type of asteroid that they visited. The Hayabusa missions used projectile firing mechanisms to dislodge surface material. This was then collected in a sample horn and for Hayabusa 1 they recovered less than one gram of material and just from the surface. Hayabusa 2 collected a bit more, 5 grams of surface material, but on the other hand, OSIRIS-REx used a touch and go or tag mechanism which collected two types of samples. The first makes up the bulk of the sample. This was collected from when a sampling head made contact with Bennu's surface and collected material by releasing a burst of nitrogen gas. The head actually penetrates about half a meter into the regolith, so you're getting deep material. The second type of sample consisted of particles captured in 24 contact pads. These are made of stainless steel Velcro on the base plate. The contact pads are designed to trap fine particles and dust directly from the surface. And in total, they managed to collect a total of 120 grams of material, double what they had been expecting actually. Bennu is among the darkest bodies in the solar system and when the aluminium lid to the sample canister was first removed, the mission team found black dust and debris on the avionics deck of the canister. Now this houses sensitive electronic components outside of the designated sample collection area which indicates that some of the collected material from the asteroid has leaked from containment. Now this just shows how complex the process of collecting material from an asteroid is. Sealing it in a canister and then being able to transport it back to Earth while avoiding any loss or contamination. The TAG-SAM head, which stands for Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism, is where the bulk of the asteroid sample is. And it's carefully handled by the team through a specialized glove box under the flow of nitrogen. Now the nitrogen is what creates an inert atmosphere devoid of oxygen. And this is super crucial to prevent any terrestrial contamination of the pristine asteroid sample. But that was a big problem. They couldn't get it fully open. Two of the 35 fasteners that kept the canister closed was stuck. They were cold welded together. Now this happens when you have two materials like two sheets of stainless steel or two sheets of metal in contact. Usually you'd have some particles that separate them to stop them from actually touching each other. But when you don't have a gap anymore, and this is typically what happens in space, the atoms of the two materials, because they're so close together, they'll bond together, forming a bond that can be even as strong as hot welding. Now, even though its name is cold welding, it's not welding due to the coldness of space, but it's just called cold welding because you don't need high temperatures to melt the metal and join them together. They're self welding. Usually it's prevented by some kind of lubrication, but I guess in this case it wasn't sufficient. So lesson learned. Anyway, it's important to note that even though the fastenings were cold welded tight, it's not that they couldn't open it. 
they could. They could simply just drill right through it. But the problem was that being able to open it whilst keeping the samples inside pristine. If you drill into it, you'd get contamination of the asteroid sample with like metal shavings and other things. So as a first step, they managed to successfully retrieve some of the sample by carefully holding down the mylar flap of the tagsam head and removing the material inside using tweezers and scoops. This careful approach managed to yield them a total mass exceeding the 60 grams required for the mission's scientific objectives. But for the rest of it, they had to develop custom tools to dislodge the bolts and get to the rest of the material. In total, they collected 120 grams of material consisting of a wide range of sizes from submicron sized dust to stones about 3.5 centimeters long. The samples confirm that Bennu is a hydrated and carbon rich asteroid, similar to the predictions from telescopic and spacecraft data. And this suggests it's a remnant of the primitive water rich materials that existed in our early solar system. To better understand and categorize the diverse collection of dust and rocks, the Cyrus Rex team broadly grouped the particles into three main categories based on their morphology, so their shape and their structure, and also their apparent brightness. Firstly, they had hummocky. These were particles that have a sub-rounded shape with an uneven surface characterized by small round mounds and depressions that kind of look like the lumpy surface of broccoli or cauliflower. While generally dark in color, these particles occasionally include small high reflectance phases. And this is due to different materials or minerals dispersed throughout the particles. Secondly, there was angular. These particles stand out due to their distinct fracturing like patterns characterized by sharp angular faces that result in hexagonal or polygon like shapes. These particles have straight parallel faces, giving them a distinct geometric appearance. Some even exhibit some apparent layering with step-like parallel exposed faces. Although they were generally dark, some of these angular particles displayed spectacular reflections or like a metallic luster on their faces. Similar to the hummocky stones, they had highly reflective inclusions present throughout the samples. And lastly, mottled. These particles are characterized by the presence of higher reflectance material that encases or overlays the low reflectance material that makes up the bulk of the stones. Interestingly, the higher reflectance material appears to fill the cracks as veins and that are typically tens of microns thick. Additionally, this higher reflectance material occurs as isolated bright flakes throughout, suggesting it's crumbly and can easily be separated from the host rock. The Bennu sample offers a rare glimpse into the composition and formation of primitive bodies like asteroids within our solar system. It sheds light on the origins of life and the early history of our planetary neighborhood. This sample has already provided crucial insights into these topics. The presence of hummocky rocks in the Bennu sample provides valuable clues about the geological processes that have shaped the asteroid's surface over time. Intriguingly, these rocks bear a resemblance to low density sedimentary formations found on Earth, like those observed in southern Italy. On our planet, hummocky rocks typically arise from the deposition and erosion of loose sediments in various environments, including alluvial fans, debris flows, and volcanic ash deposits. Their rounded, irregular, and cauliflower-like textures result from repeated cycles of erosion, transportation, and redeposition of materials. So it's likely that these hummocky rocks on Bennu formed through similar processes, but on a much smaller scale in the environment of an asteroid. The angular-shaped rocks and fracturing patterns on these particles are likely the result of impact events on Bennu's surface. Impacts from meteorites or other small objects that can cause rocks to shatter and fracture along specific planes. And these would create angular polygon-like shapes with sharp edges and faces. Indeed, the sample collection site is the Hokoi crater, which is a 20 meter diameter impact crater on the asteroid. 
The higher reflectance veins in the mottled rocks suggest that Bennu may have experienced episodes of water-related activity, altering its surface over time, and the friable or crumbly-like nature of the higher reflectance material may be attributed to space weathering processes. So again, like micrometeorite impacts or even solar wind radiation, these can alter the surface properties of asteroids, affecting their composition and their texture. The analyses showed a lot of similarity between the Bennu asteroid and the Ryugu asteroids, but importantly, low density material, material that probably wouldn't survive the atmospheric re-entry is abundant throughout all of them. So it's really important that they do sample return missions because otherwise we wouldn't get most of this material back. The sample analyses found a reservoir of magnesium phosphate, which was kind of surprising because it's rare in astro materials. And initially they even thought it was contamination. Unfortunately, they didn't find any signs of life. Anyway, that's all I have time for in this week's video. There's likely more about the sample that we still don't know yet than we actually do know. And hopefully we'll learn more in the years to come because they'll be studying this sample for ages. Anyway, thank you so much for my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe. Hey space cats, fly with me to the stars. Faster than light